Jesus. To all our online viewers, if you just tuned in, please make sure you hit that like button and share it with those who are your friends and family members, to all of those who are outside the sanctuary in their cars, who thought it not robbery to get up this morning and drive in. We'd like to welcome you. Hallelujah. We welcome you. And as we said to our online viewers, we say also to you, make sure you hit the like button and share this morning's worship. Is that all right? To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Now we're going to have our scripture reading coming from 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at the 22nd verse. Have your Bibles please turn with us. Begin in 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at the 22nd verse. We're going to travel on down to the end of that, that part of scripture. Amen. Those in the sanctuary, if you have your Bibles, you can read along with us. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears, and what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to the demons, for the people to be and to make him a man, and to do for you great things and terrible for thy life before thy people, which thou would be nice, to be for you, for the nation of the heavens. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people in you, to be a people unto thee forever, and thou Lord, thou hast become their God. And now, O oh God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever. And do as thou hast said, and let thy name be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts is the God of Israel. And let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. For thou, O Lord, our host of God of Israel, has revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee a house. Therefore has thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words, thou art thy God, and thy word be true. And thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord, hallelujah, has spoken thee, and with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed. Forever. Glory to God. If we bow our hands and say our family pray together. Father, I thank you that your word promises deliverance for the children of the righteous. I claim that promise for my household. Devil, you can't have my children. He is defeated in Jesus' name. Say you is lost. You don't get my children. You don't get my grandchildren. These children are the seed of the righteous. And I'm drawing the bloodline around myself, my family, and my church. Devil, you cannot cross the bloodline. The blood overcomes you. The blood speaks to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father had said, mercy, mercy, mercy. I 
thank you. We thank you that even in this pandemic, that you are preparing us. Hallelujah! To be a sanctuary. To be a sanctuary. No matter where you are, we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are Thank God for all the Zion Knights who are outside of the building. Yeah. 
they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own tongue, which we were born?
Rather, even though it's not the way that we traditionally have been able to come together, we've still been able to come together uh, to worship the Lord uh, in spirit and in truth. I was excited because I knew that in spite of the virus, in spite of everything that was going on, uh, that following Sunday, which is now today, we would be celebrating the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Why was I excited? Because Palm Sunday not only represents Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but it represents the beginning of the end of the devil's stronghold over mankind. It represented the beginning of the end of the death sentence upon man to be separated from God, to be broken apart from God, to not be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, but to simply have our sins covered. It represented the end of an existence in which we are wrapped in the chains of flesh and sin and the grave. It represented the end of an idea that there is no hope. That when Christ comes in on Palm Sunday, and as the crowd and the multitude cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the rock, that Jesus himself was coming in to say, I am the last lamb, that I am the lamb, the last lamb that will be led to the slaughter so that every chain and so that every illness and so that every disease and so that every tool that the devil will seek to use to keep my people afflicted and underfoot and to keep them from moving on to be what God has called them to be is coming to an end. And as I had that understanding in my mind, I was excited because I knew that in spite of Corona, in spite of all of the issues that we are facing, in spite of all the struggles, Palm Sunday was coming. That Palm Sunday was coming and that it represents not only uh, just a day for us, but it, is, it represents for us the time in which Jesus says enough is enough, but I am coming to set the captives free. I'm coming to shed my blood. The cross is in front of me. Uh, I see the cross, but more importantly, I see beyond the cross and I see the freedom, the salvation, the hope that my blood will give for my people. And as I sat and pondered and was excited about the coming of Palm Sunday. All of you know that that following Monday, we got the order, we got the, the instruction, we got the, the edict from the governor which says that we have to stay what at home. I began to think about, pray about, and uh, go into a contemplation about exactly how that uh, will imply to the church. How does it imply to the church when we have the 10 or less order yet? We must stay at home. And as I began to ponder and, and use my legal education to try to parse out how we can continue uh, to come into the house of, of God, to live stream, to you, the Ecclesia worship service, I began to notice something strange, Brother Kendall, all over social media. Folk began to say that the church is not what essential. The world began to post all over social media that the church is not essential. Stay home. Don't come to church. Church is not essential. I'd rather stay at home because I don't want to get sick at church. The church is not essential. We go to the liquor store to get our alizé and whatever folks be drinking. We go to the marijuana store to get our fill of the bug. And even some of us go to the street corner to cop our narcotic. But the world has said that the church is not what essential. And as I begin to read and watch that, listen, understand, 
church was saying that the church is not essential. What, 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 what bothered my spirit, what, what caused me great concern is the idea that the church itself classified itself as non-essential. So I began to pull up the dictionary and try to put a meaning to the term, to the phrase, to help calculate this term, to help us understand exactly what it is we're saying about ourselves. The word essential is defined by the Merriam-Webster dictionary as meaning this, relating to or constituting the essence of something. Inherent. The second definition is it, it, to be essential means of the utmost importance. It is a basic means that is indispensable. It is what? Necessary. So to be non-essential is to not be of utmost importance. To not be a basic need for survival. To not be indispensable. So that when the world and even the church says we are not essential, we are declaring to the world and to the atmosphere that we are not necessary. And as I was reading and as I was studying, as I was praying and asking the Lord to give me a word to bring on for today, and as he gave me that topic, the Lord directed me to Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 through 8, but all of us, I want you to... Go back and reflect and read verses 1 through 41. And for contextual purposes, let me give you the background in Acts chapter 2. The apostles have come together waiting on the Holy Ghost to show up to the apostles. They've been told that the Holy Ghost will fall on them on a particular time, a particular moment, and they are gathered together. And at the appointed time, the Holy Ghost falls upon them. The 11 are there. Peter is there. The 11 that walked with Jesus are there. Judas isn't there because he's dead. And uh, even though uh, the apostles come together and elect somebody to replace uh, uh, Judas, I don't count them because Jesus himself appoints Paul. And so uh, Paul's not here yet. So all that is there are the 11 apostles that were called and ordained by God. They're there waiting for the presence of God to show up. Watch this. And while they're waiting, the Holy Ghost falls on each and every one of them. And as the Holy Ghost falls on each and every one of them, the text tells us that they begin to speak in tongues. They begin to speak in the tongues of all of those who are outside of where they were. They begin to speak in unknown tongues. They begin to speak in tongues that were foreign to them. And as they begin to speak, both outside the house began to hear what the apostles were saying. But not only did they hear what the apostles were saying, the text tells us that they heard it in their own language. They begin to ask themselves and, and begin to ponder amongst themselves, how is it that these Galileans don't know our language and now all of a sudden speaking in our native language? They began to ask themselves, and how is it that these Galileans, who just moments before couldn't speak our language, are now speaking in our native tongue? The text tells us that while there were those that were excited and astonished, there were others, naysayers and doubters, who said they must be drunk. They must be out of their mind. They, they hear what's being said. They, they see the miraculous before their eyes. But they say amongst themselves, they must be drunk. And as all of this begins to happen, Peter, who is named the rock of the church in Matthew 16, begins to stand up and give what many consider to be the first sermon of the church. He begins to stand up and begins to profess the name of God, begins to stand up and begins to preach the name of God. And at the end of his sermon, the text tells us that 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ Jesus. And as many historians say and believe, this begins the church. This begins uh, the organized movement of the church where uh, the followers of Christ go from being just the disciples 
that were amongst him and those that heard him, they here and there to being an organized group that have come together and say, for God I live and for God I die. From that moment, we see the essentialness of the church. We see uh, that the church comes together under the Holy Ghost. And, and at that moment, God begins, God the Holy Ghost begins to empower and endow the apostles to go out and preach and teach the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're going to understand the importance of this moment, you've got to understand the history of the church. The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. And originally in Greek, the word ekklesia was used to mean a political assembly of ancient Greek states. So when ancient Greek states Athens and, and Sparta and, and other and the Greek states would come together uh, to deal with political issues, that meeting, that gathering was called the Ecclesia. Well, as the church, as this movement, as the body of Christ began to grow, we adopted the name to represent ourselves. So not only does Ecclesia mean a political gathering, but it also means the body of Christ. It quite literally means the church. Are y'all with me? So when we talk about the church, don't get it twisted. We're not talking about a building with an address, but we're talking about the people that cry out and call on the name of the Lord. So when you say that the church is not essential, you're not talking about the building, but you're talking about the people. When you say that the church is not essential, you're not talking about the brick and mortar, but you're talking about those of us that confess the name of Jesus. Are you with me? And so if you're going to understand the importance of the new church, you've got to understand the old. Before I get to the crux of the sermon, give you the historical context, we see that God establishes the church, yes, under Peter, when he names him the rock through Christ Jesus. But before then, we see an Old Testament version of the church. The text tells us in Exodus chapter 25 that God gives the instruction to the man of God to build the wilderness tabernacle. And in the wilderness tabernacle would be housed the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was hidden behind two veils. There was a veil which separated the holy place. And then there was a second veil that separated the most holy place, or the holies of holies. Stick with me, y'all. And in the holies of holies abided the presence of God. And in order to have an encounter with the presence of God, you had to show up what? To the tabernacle. You couldn't have his presence in your house. You had to show up to the what? Tabernacle. You couldn't have his presence in your tent. You had to show up to the what? Tabernacle. The presence of God didn't just show up to talk to everybody. The Old Testament shows us that God only talked directly to a selected few, but to the masses, to the children of Israel. If they wanted to have an encounter with God, they had to show up. They build him 
uh, a temple. They built him uh, Solomon's temple, and, and it's grand and it's opulent, and it's everything that you would expect the temple of God to be. But like in the wilderness tabernacle, God's presence is hidden, is, is kept behind the veil in the holies of holies. I wonder if somebody knows what I'm trying to say that I thank God for the fact that when I go to see God, I don't have to worry about him hiding or being behind a veil. I'm so grateful to God that I can go to him now and not worry about being stricken but that his glory and that his grace is so sufficient that he sent his son Jesus so now I can suck with him and fellowship with him. Now I don't have to go to a building to find him but he lives on the inside of me. But I wonder if we can just take 30 seconds. I'm getting ahead of myself. To give God praise for the fact that a veil don't separate me from God no more. But I can fall on my knees and give God praise. I can stand on my feet and wave my hand. I can stand at my kitchen and sing my song. Because I realize my brothers and my sisters that God's presence isn't confined to a building. for 
ourselves. Can I stop there for a moment and say that in this time today, the world has come to a place where we see God as a placebo, where it's something that we do to make us feel comfortable, but there is no real substance to him. There is no real base to him. There is no realness to him. In fact, we can do without him. I don't need God. God is for those who are not intelligent. I don't need God. God is for those that cannot deal with the fact that when they die, they go into a place of non-existence. I don't need God. God is for those that can't believe and conceptualize that the world came from a big bang. I don't need God. People who need God are those that are dying from disease and can't deal with the fact that their life is over. I don't need God. God is for those that are sitting around waiting for something to drop out of the sky instead of getting up and doing the work for themselves. I don't need God. God, he is not what he says. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We hear it all over the news. We hear it all over social media. We hear it from our colleagues. We hear it from our friends. The God, the church has come to a place of not being essential. We see this here with Hoffman and, fin and, and, and Phineas. They don't believe that there are any consequences behind stealing from God. Why? Because there's no fear of God. Why? Because I argue to you, my brothers and my sisters, in their mind, God is non-essential. Who is God? What is God? We, 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 this is how we survive. This is how we eat, Brother Kendall. This is how we make it to tomorrow. Yeah. So if we stop yeah. giving the people what they want, then they'll stop paying their tithes. And we can't deal with them not paying their tithes. So we got to keep the show going because it's essential for us to be able to eat. But there's no God here. Some of us know what I'm talking about. Corona has been a test for us. How many of us in the body of Christ have made the decision that even though we've limited, I'm going to go in and keep preaching and teaching the word of God. I'm not going to continue to play reruns. No, I want God to use me to give a fresh word to help somebody in their daily need. I wonder have we forgotten is essential that we need him daily. I don't need something from last year. I need a fresh bread from God. Oh, let, me, let, me, let me stop there for a moment. Some text tells us that in their mind we can draw the conclusion that Christ is now that God in their mindset, in their frame of thinking is non-essential. He's a non-factor. We're not worried about God or what he says or what he thinks. Because as people give their offering, we're taking it off of the altar and eating it for ourselves. And if that wasn't bad enough, the text tells us that Hophni and Phineas, Phineas, while Eli, their father, was doing the will of God, this last great <laughs> priest uh, of uh, Israel at this moment, as he is working and, and serving God, as he is trying to mentor Samuel, who will come up and take his place, his own sons who've had his example, who've seen him work day in and day out for the glory of God, who see and understand how essential God is to Eli, who recognize and see that God record, that God loves Eli and Eli loves God. These individuals that know that God means something to Eli, they don't have that same not only do they rob from the altar, but the text tells us that while Eli was doing the work on the inside of the house, that Phineas and Hophni were sleeping with the women on the outside of the house. That while Eli was serving on the inside of God's house, that Phineas and Hophni were taking advantage of the children of God's wives right outside the church. No fear of God. No a fear of God's might or his power. Why? Because God had become a non-factor to them. I wonder how many of us in the church today have awoken to the fact that in our lives God has become a non-factor. Uh, we come to church, we do it because it looks good, it feels good, we want to come and rub shoulders with those who are next to us. We do it because we want to get connected to that next person who can give us a job. But really Church, but we have forgotten. 
essentialness of God. And so we come expecting superficial stuff. We come seeking to get our needs met. But we've forgotten that God is essential. So we treat him like a non All right, okay, stick with me. Watch this, y'all. So text elder, Hockney and Phineas, they have no respect for God. They have no fear of God. They have no concern for God. And even though they are representatives of God's house, their actions, their behavior, that's not mirror, that they see God as a factor essential in their lives. So they treat God however they want to treat him. my brothers and my sisters, that for Jesus it means something else. Because he recognizes and understands that what he's about to do is shed his blood. And his blood won't be painted over doorposts. But his, his blood will be drenched over the lives of you and over me. He doesn't go and run out to try to buy toilet paper because everybody panics on him. He goes to his father's house. The first stop that he makes when he gets into the city of God is he goes to his father's house. He goes into his father's house and he sees a sight that disturbs him. God created the temple the tabernacle, and the church to be a place in which the Spirit of God could reside and dwell in. Yet, as we saw with Phineas and Hophni, this idea of God being essential to non-essential, a non-factor, infects the people of God. Over generations, they turn from God and turn to other ways of thinking and other ways of doing. And even when they come back to God, they begin to compromise and change the identity of who they are. How can you say that, Pastor? Look at verse number 13, continuing down. The text tells us that when Jesus makes his way into the temple to pray and to fellowship with the Spirit of the Father, that when he walks in, he sees the money changes in the household of faith, exchanging money in the household of faith. He sees transactions taking place in the household of faith. But you know the one thing that the Bible does not tell us that Jesus sees is the people of God praying in the household of faith. They're exchanging money. They're selling goods. They're selling all types of stuff. But the one thing that Jesus does not tell us that he sees us doing is what? Praying.
essential because it's changed its identity. Are y'all with me? I just want to argue right here for a moment, my brothers and my sisters, is that before we even talk about the world calling us non-essential, we've got to come to the place that we recognize what God called us to be and do in the first place. We've got to come back to the place, my brothers and my sisters, where we recognize that God has called us as the church washes to be a place where his presence dwells, where his presence resides. He's called us to be his temple in which he can take rest in. We've got to come back to a place where we recognize ourselves as being more than just a place where we go in to pay our tithes and a little cute and a wave at our neighbor. But we've got to recognize that God has called us to be the household of faith. We should be a place where no fear resides. We should be a place where folk come and find refuge. We should be a place where folk find hope. But I wonder, my brothers and my sisters, if we'll be able to stand in this season of Corona because somewhere along the line we've forgotten what makes us what? The century. The text tells us as I begin to wrap this thing up, watch this, the text tells us that Jesus kicks over the money tables, the changing tables, the exchange tables. Because the temple has become a Walmart. Mm, the temple has become a Costco. Mm. The temple has become a BJ's or a Sam's Club. And they forgot what God called them to be in Exodus chapter 25. Mm. And that is the house of God in which yeah. his spirit might dwell amongst his people. They forgot that, that God called for the temple to be his house and the center of his people so that the people may always see him. They forgot what made them essential. And because my brothers and my sisters, they forgot what made them essential. The Romans were able to do whatever it is they wanted to do to the temple of God. Why? Because the people of God forgot what made the temple essential in the first place. Y'all with me? And as we continue to read on, the Bible tells us at the end of John chapter 2, that after Jesus kicks over the table, the Pharisees, the, the those who Thank you all. Coming into the house of God, kicking over the table. Who do you think you are coming in trying to change how we do things? Christ looks at them, and I can imagine that as Christ looks at them, he's wondering in his mind, y'all profess to be pontificators of the law of Moses, and yet. The one that you've been waiting for is standing in front of you. And you can't even feel my presence. Why is that? Because you've gotten away from what made you essential in the first place. Here the son of God that all of Israel had been waiting for for generations is in the house of God. And those that are supposed to be administering the house of God, instead of falling on their knees, giving God praise for the fact that his son has shown up, they are in his face saying, who do you think you are coming into this house trying to change how we do things? And Jesus looks at them and says, in three days, this temple is going to come down, but I'm going to build it up again. And they look to Jesus and say, it took 46 years to build this temple. What makes you think that you can tear down this temple and build it in 53 days? But they didn't realize, my brothers and my sisters, that God didn't come for that temple. But he was lifting up another temple. He said, if I, if I lifted up I'll draw all men unto me what are you saying pastor God is using this season to bring us back to a place of remembrance where we realize that the power isn't in the building but the power is in God yeah it's not essential to come in the building because we are the church we are the church that they gates the bell Got so 
far away hey. from who no. God, they understand of who God is. They got so far away from their understanding of what they've been waiting for. Yeah. That when the one they're waiting for shows up, yeah. they're arguing over the fact that God keep the money changes yeah. out. But that's the time where I would have given God praise. Yeah. I'm not worried about the money changes. God, the sun has shown up. I'm not worried about the mercies. God, the sun has shown up.
because I'm sure this is going to go viral and I want everybody to see the theological connections to understand what God is trying to say. That when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, after their exchange with each other, the Bible tells us that Jesus tells the woman that our ancestors, that our forefathers worship God in the mountain mm -hmm. and worship God in Jerusalem, in the temple. Uh -huh. But the time is coming and the time is now. Uh -huh. He says, where they that worship him mm -hmm. will worship him in spirit <laughs> and in truth. Yeah. So where you look to him in the mountain, oh, y'all not with me. Yeah. Or where you look to him in the city of Jerusalem, now you can look to him in your house. You can look for him in your car. You can look for him on your job. You can look for him in the hospital room. You can look for him wherever you might be. We may be on lockdown, but God is still free. He still sits high. And he still looks low. And I wonder if I got a few believers that say, yeah, I can be locked in the house. But God still goes everywhere. Bishop Jakes got a line of very eloquently. I love Bishop. 
said that there isn't a war on church and we've got to be careful and I agree. We've got to be careful not to get militant in this season and say we're going to take on the state. But the issue that I take is that where it is in the past, leadership understood and knew that in times like this, I can't move without hearing from God. That today, in this age, the world has the audacity to say that the church is not essential. What is the church that told you that in times before Christ is confined to a building? But when he allowed himself to be lifted, as we see in Matthew 27, beginning around verse number 50, that when he cries out and gives up the ghost, as he was lifted, as he prophesied it in John chapter 2, as he's lifted in Matthew 27, and he gives up the ghost, the text tells us that the earth shook yeah. and that the veil was rent. Yeah. And Stephanie, this is what blew my mind. Watch this. At this moment, the church, the interior of the church, the part that you and I uh -huh. were unworthy to ever go into, let alone see. Yes. The text tells us now uh -huh. yeah. that when Jesus gives up the ghost, mm -hmm. the thing that kept us right. from being in an intimate relationship with God uh -huh. is rent. rent. Now this is what made me shout, Ayana. The text tells us in Matthew 27 that after Jesus is lifted, uh -huh. his body is torn as he's crucified. The veil is rent. And the text says, hey, Reverend hey. Thomas doesn't say, the text says, uh -huh. Pastor Junior doesn't say, hey. the text says, hey. Pastor Thomas doesn't say, hey. that when the veil was rent Woo. and the church was made open, uh -huh. when the veil was rent, hey. and now not just, just the pastor can yeah. come in, but the people can come yeah. in, when the veil was Woo. rent, you ought to be sweet right now hey. when the veil was rent. Hey. You ought to be writing it all over Facebook. You ought to be typing it in the page. When the veil is rich, I give God praise that when the veil is rich, the blind see. When the veil is rich, the sick are made whole. When the veil is rich, the poor become rich. When the veil is rich, the lost become found. When the veil is rich, the
then the temple had to be restructured. Yeah. I believe yeah. by faith yeah. that God is using Corona yeah. to teach us how to restructure. Yeah. It's not in the car you drive, yeah. but it's in the God you worship. It's not in how many members you have, but it's in the God you worship. Brothers 
and my sister. The devil has been playing a strategic war against the church, convincing the world that the church no longer has any relevance. But the reason why we are where we are is because we begin to take that on for ourselves. Jesus. So on Facebook, we're talking about stay home. The church ain't essential. John Legend can post yesterday that pastors are killing your grandmothers and your aunties. No, he said, don't let these pastors kill your grandmothers and your aunties. He said, I'm the grandson of a preacher. But don't come to church. I love John Legend. But don't come to church. Can I close with this? Don't come to the building. Uh -huh. Go to church. Uh -huh. Hey! Uh -huh.
says, you just look at them and say, I'm on the list. <laughs> what you mean? I said the church down the central. Do you and might not be. But I'm on the list. Yes. Brother Kendall, I was brought with a fight. That's right. My name is written in the book called The Rain yeah. of the Life. Yes, it is. So even when name says, That's right. I'm not essential. Uh -huh. God says, baby, don't you worry about them. You're on my list. Yeah. Body of Christ keeps saying that. Jesus. Keep doing what God calls you. Name. We may not be able to gather in the building, Woo. but you keep Thank lifting you. up the name of Jesus. We may not be able to fellowship together, holding hands, but on that job, when that person is freaking out, you continue to minister like God has called you to minister. The church doesn't end because the doors are closed. That's right. Church doesn't end because man says we're not essential. That's right. God has a way of making those who say that we're non-essential yes. call us up and say, I need your help. Yeah. I find it ironic. But the same governor who said that we're not essential called for all of us to call on the name of God. Didn't he say that every knee must bow and yes. every tongue yes. down with the knee? So stop taking on the moniker that the church is essential. essential. Stop allowing folk to make you think that God is limited to a building. No, y'all, we can have church in our life parties. We can have church on the phone and I'll call this call. Yeah, yeah. When you're praying around, yes. God can show up and show out. Yes, don't let the man, don't let the world yes. cause you to think of God in a limited way. Right. You keep on keep moving and watch how God show up and show out in your life. Yeah. Because even though the church may not be essential to men, the church is essential to God. So God in this moment that is yours. I preached it and I taught it. As best as I can preach it. And teach you. Came as clean and as, and as concise as I could. And now, God, if there are any holes that I may have in my humanity left, I ask God in your divinity that you fill those holes. But God, you help us to stop taking on the classifications of men. Help us to stop changing our identity so that we can stay relevant in the eyes of men. Help us to recognize that when we continue to walk in who you call us to, that man ultimately must always cry out on your name. That we're in position in a place to show the world what it means to love Jesus. What it means to surrender so God and camp the church. Every member of the body of Christ. Regardless of denomination or affiliation, regardless of whatever church their name may be on the world, help us to remember that beyond the church homes that we belong to, we belong to the body of Christ. We're heirs and joint heirs of Christ. And we're the bride of Christ. God, help us to stay having an all to stay. When the world is going crazy, Help us to be able to stand comfortable and resolute upright. Yes, taking all the precautions that are required, but continue to stand even if it means we're standing in our homes, still standing. Being a sign of inspiration to our children, to our loved ones, to our neighbors. That God has not given us a spirit, but a power and a love and a sound mind. But we can only do that when we pivot back to the place that God has called us to put in first, to seek ye first, the kingdom of God. All his righteousness. Help us to come back to that. Now God, I pray that you cover your people. That you continue to lift us up. That you continue to be with all of those who are stressed out, concerned, afraid. Give us all of our medical providers and our first remind them that while they're on the front line and they feel abandoned by the administration, feel abandoned by the federal government,
continue to be our head lifter. Continue to bear us up in the places that we may fall in. So we can continue to walk in you. So we can continue to walk in the essentialness of God. So that we can make continue to be the soul of the earth, giving this plain world. We love you. There's someone watching, and you don't know the Lord. And you say, Pastor, their word, listen to me. You say, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I feel it. But I have no connection to God. The Bible says in Romans 10 9. If you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. All things have to All things have to Maybe you'd be saying, well, maybe you're saying, well, Pastor, I was saved, but like Hophni and Phineas, like Israel, somewhere along the line, I stopped seeing God as a sinner. He became a non factor. So I come during the holidays, I come during Easter and Paul on Sunday. It's crazy because I can't even get my home.
pray for the bread. God, we pray that you do the same for the cup. That you transform, that you use them. The Holy Testament that you need in our world. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. As we begin to take the communion, we thank God that because of his love, we have the name.